Tate. So without further ado, I call up uh, our panelists, our women leaders in journalism, to come on up for uh, our opening session. Uh, this is going to be moderated by Christina Panson, uh, Hong Kong director at Brunswick, and I'm going to pass it on over to her, and she's going to introduce our panelists. So please, everyone, welcome uh, our first session. Thanks, Remy. And this is on, yep. Good morning to everyone. Glad to see such a good crowd this morning, especially lots of women. And uh, the comment was, uh, where are the women? Where are the women leaders? Because I gather you had an opening session yesterday of regional uh, leaders for news organizations, and I think they were maybe all men. Am I wrong? Am I right? Well, here's a, uh, here's a panel of women just to show you that there are women in leading senior roles at various media organizations. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, I, I myself have been uh, at a media organization, even though I'm now at Brunswick, the PR agency in Hong Kong as a director. I spent 25 years with Reuters uh, in New York, Dallas, Singapore, India, Vietnam. Um, so I've had sort of an Asia and an American experience in my reporting. And I also was an AAJ member way back when, possibly before some of you were born. Uh, when I was in New York. So I'm very pleased to be uh, part of this very distinguished crowd today. Um, I will introduce our panelists and um, we want to make this very, very interactive. I, I gather that there are no shy people out there in the audience, so I'm not gonna have to coax you to ask questions. So instead of reserving the last bit, five, you know, 15 minutes for questions, I would love for you, you all to chime in and ask questions as we go and as things occur to you. Um, let me introduce my panel, first of all. Julie Mackinnon is a reporter for the LA Times. She flew in from Beijing on Friday. Yay, Julie. And what I was struck by Julie's background was, was the confluence of, of Hollywood film reporting, uh, which sounds fascinating to me, and, and how that applies in this part of the world. Um, Julie studied uh, in uh, East Asian studies. Uh, she has a master's from UCLA, so she's, she's quite familiar with this part of the world and that. Previously worked for the uh, Washington Post, for Foreign Affairs and Metro Desk, and uh, also for the IHT before it got rebranded into the International New York Times. Um, next to her is no stranger to your group, Angie Lau. Um, very pleased to say that she is, of course, the lead anchor for Bloomberg TV, so she is literally the most senior person, and she happens to be a woman, a very accomplished one. FCC board member, um, 16 years in journalism, is that right? And um, is part of an organization, Bloomberg, even though, okay, I used to work for Reuters and people who know the dynamics know that they're dreaded rivals. But I will give kudos to Bloomberg for having started a program a few years ago that looks at the role of women in global economies, right? And I think there are quite a lot of journalists at Bloomberg who look at this, try to uncover more women across different areas and try to live it as well. Uh, I understand, Angie, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the number of, the, of, of bureau chiefs in, in this region, Asia Pacific, include in, in uh, Karachi, Melbourne, and Hanoi, is that right? So that's good, I mean, you need to sort of like demonstrate it as well. Um, so so, so that's, that's something that, that's a manifestation of how, how you know, one organization sees women. Um, Deborah Khan, in, in the summary white, uh, is an executive producer at the Wall Street Journal. Um, Deborah and I know each other from Reuters, from the Reuters days. Deborah's been in journalism for more than 15 years. You were three years with Reuters Insider, which was a, a specialized video product for our professional clients. Um, and also presented with Star TV, that I didn't know. Um, and you've done lots and lots of exclusive interviews with, with political and corporate leaders. Um, you might share a few stories with us, I think. So that'll be quite interesting. Um, I think I've al already seen you, s um, you, know, you, you talk about some, some of these experiences of interviewing key people and whether or not it makes a difference if you're a woman. So, so that's one thing we want to explore. Um, uh, also, an, uh, an extremely familiar face is Yang, even though I just met her today. Uh, but her reputation clearly precedes her. She's been, of course, very uh, dynamically running a, a lot of things here at this fine university. Thank you very much for being the host for this established the Journalism and Media Studies Center in 1999. Uh, you've, you've done so many firsts, you've won so many awards, I probably couldn't cover them all. 
Uh, but it was, I was intrigued to know that Ying had, had done a stint at the New York Daily News, um, covered some very interesting stories in New York around the same time I was working in New York, um, has taught at Columbia. I, Columbia is my alma mater. I, I studied at the International Affairs School. And you're very active in terms of in the blogosphere. And she doesn't hold back on her opinions, OK? So just expect more from her. But you know, we, we're hearing good things. But also be prepared to throw questions at us. Let me, let me lay a little bit of the scene. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid to say that the stats are not very um, encouraging, shall we say, but maybe not surprising. 73% um, of the top global media management jobs belong to guys. So even though I think men and women enter the profession, the media profession, in quite equal numbers, um, when it comes to the top decision makers, women are not as equally represented. Two-thirds of the global reporting jobs are held by men. And where it gets a little bit more even is in the senior media jobs where 41% are held by women. So you may wonder about Asia Pacific, and I looked that up too. So in Asia Pacific, um, women fall behind at all levels of management and governance at media companies in Asia Pacific. A little bit um, depressing. And maybe unsurprisingly, in Asia Pacific, men earn more than women at the senior levels. A very big topic, something that we sometimes don't discuss a lot of because women are sometimes a little bit shy about talking about money. We don't want to talk about money. We just want to say, I just want to do my job well. I don't want to talk about money. But it is important. It is a very important measure uh, of our market value and what we contribute. So. Just to, to seed it out there, and, and some, we, you all have, had, have been great with offering some themes that you, you feel passionately about. So I'm going to kick off by talking about um, the fact that we had a very high profile female leave the media industry recently. Uh, Jill Abramson of the New York Times. Are people familiar with that? Is anyone unfamiliar with that situation? Okay. And what was striking to me, and I think it struck at least several of our panelists, is the behaviors that were cited in her departure. Pushy, not collaborative, sort of didn't get along, basically. Um, interesting to me that these were cited as some of the, the big issues about her, her departure. And I wondered whether the panel wants to kick off a little bit by, by talking a little bit about that uh, in terms of a factor, not a factor? Why is it a factor? What do you think? And you know how much that plays into how people assess women leadership? Angie. I think I'm going to be a little controversial. Go ahead. Um, but it's my point of view, so it doesn't reflect my employers. It's uh, something that I thought about. Um, because initially, when she left, New York Times, it was a surprise. I mean, she had arrived at New York Times with great aplomb. It was the first time a woman had held that senior role. So there was a lot of expectation placed on her. And I think in the 21st century, that is a little unfair to place it entirely on her gender. She does not represent all of women around the globe. She is a human being with strengths and weaknesses, as we all do. And some of those weaknesses ended up in a situation where things did not work out in that environment. And when she left, I think there was a lot of focus placed on, was it because she was a woman? Was it because she thought she was being assertive and people thought she was a big B? Those certainly are the things that conflict all of us. But I think also part of it is an awareness from our point of view that this is the perception. And how do you address that as an individual? And to understand that there may be gender biases out there, but how do you deal with it? I don't know Jill. I've met her a couple of times, but I don't know know her. Um, I don't know what it was like working with her. I don't know her personality. But I think, ultimately, it would be 
unfair to brand her departure as a weakness for women? Um, I actually think that that incident was handled so badly, uh, you can't even bring the gender issue into it. I think on both sides, um, her demise at the New York Times was probably one of the biggest public relation failures in the course of history for, for any uh, journalism organization. And I think, you know, um, what was so terrible about it was it was so much mudslinging on both sides that I think it hurt, hurt both of them. So I know the gender card was thrown out there, um, and I know that the New York Times came back and said this wasn't gender, basically it was incompetence. But I think, you know, actually it made a really bad statement on both sides, and it was not, um, I, I have a hard time saying, you know, I believe, I, I don't know what the circumstances were and I don't, of her departure. I don't think anyone really knows, but it turned into a really ugly public relations thing. Um, and, you know, it did get me reflecting a little bit about, okay, well, when uh, the New York Times management stood up and said, well, basically it didn't have to do with gender, it just had to do with incompetence, and then, you know, that started quite a firestorm of, oh, attacking women and, you know, she was a powerful woman and therefore, and I'm not so sure that in this case, maybe we don't know what went on behind the scenes, but because of the way it was handled, I think it detracted a lot from both sides. Um, I don't know what happened inside, but I think what's lost in this firestorm is the journalism, is the way um, the New York Times has delivered their stories and major stories uh, under her. Um, and those are public record, right? And she is known, uh, and the Green War gave, gave her credit for pushing back um, standing up to the surveillance regime, standing up to the Obama government on the matter of uh, surveillance of individuals. Uh, I think we, since we're in Asia, uh, we should also note that Jill put together a most formidable bureau in covering China okay, under very, very tough circumstances, right? Uh, it broke stories. Right? There are major international organizations who pull back from covering China, right? following the princelings, follow the money, do the tough investigative journal stories. Right? There are data, there's records out there. Right? You need to do the digging. Um, it's very hard for Chinese journals to do that. Uh, also hard for Hong Kong uh, media, although I think they can do more. Uh, so it's really to the New York Times credit where Jill Abramson serves as chief editor that they ran those stories. Um, it's a lot of resources and um, also the, the New York Times suffer financial uh, 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 loss you know, because the, the Chinese site to this day is still blocked um, shortly after it was launched. Right? And also, major part of the, I think the English site is still blocked, right? Um, where Mike Forsyth there, you know, he's one of the star uh, 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 China Bureau that Abramson has collected. And so I think, let's look at the journalism. I'm sure there are gender matters there, right? Uh, I agree with you totally. Um, gender is an, an, an issue in, in newsrooms. When I started in 1990 at the China Daily News, I was triple minority. I was an immigrant. Uh, I am. I was immigrant, a woman, and an ethnic minority. Right, and 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 so I know the stories. I dealt with like whites, you know, or or, uh, or supervisors or colleagues, but I have also wonderful um, colleagues who are white, you know, and also black. But journalism comes first, 
I think that's a good, great point. I mean, in terms of uh, look, let's look at the results, let's look at the substance and outcome, not only the style, but I guess what's intriguing to me uh, is, is how women sometimes still get judged on the style, on style points that a male leader, it sort of gets skimmed over and they only want to just use the, the substance part of it. Julie, of course, is in Beijing, so running up against some of the things that we just talked about. So what, what do you think? Um, I guess my comment might be that um, some of, the, and I say this as someone who's been an editor for more years than a reporter, but um, I think some of the qualities that help people, both men and women, get ahead as reporters um, might not make for very good qualities as editors, um, which is to say that some of the best reporters I know are extremely individualistic, extremely um, uh, you know, self-motivated, but um, you know, are very uh, competitive, often with their colleagues, even um, perhaps not super collaborative. Um, and I'm not saying that's exclusive, but I think a lot of the people who rise to the top of the reporting ranks perhaps exhibit those traits more than others, um, and it makes them fantastic reporters. Sometimes switching into editing or managing for people like that is very difficult. And I'm not speaking to Jill's case in particular, I'm just speaking in general. Um, so you can rise very high as a reporter and seen as a very competent journalist, but the skill set needed to be an excellent, excellent reporter and the skill set needed to be an excellent manager and editor are actually different. And um, I think, you know, as we think as we as women think about our career trajectories, you know, when we make a transition between one or, or, or both of those jobs, um, we should think about, you know, what skills we might be weaker on or stronger on and how we can round that out. I mean, I've felt that myself and run into walls myself, um, realizing, not realizing I had my elbows out too much sometimes. And, um, you know, in the end it hurt me. and. Um, you know, you'll get that feedback from people and it's important to listen to it. But um, uh, journalism, I think, is really structured very differently than a, a lot of other kind of businesses where, you know, if you rise up in the ranks in a bank or something, your skills kind of build on top of each other and kind of maybe in a natural progression. But um, reporting and editing are just really, really, they're really different jobs. I think it's important to remember that. I think that's a great point, Julie. Thank you. I think we have a question here already from the. Yeah. Hello. Um, there, I think in the whole saga, though, there was this important issue of her um, being paid significantly less than her predecessor. Yeah, the money. And so I guess my question for the panel is: Is that something that you've all faced in your careers, being paid less than men? Wow, we're getting into the real personal stuff here. Is anyone? Let <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, it's a very relevant question because you know what I found from from the, my different stages in my career is that women, regardless of where they're from, find it very uncomfortable <laughs> to ask for more money. I mean, this is just I don't know what it is. There's some there's, there's something inherent in women who just want to be. I just want to do a good job. I just want to show you how loyal I am. I just want to show you how much I love this job. Or, you know, I'm just so grateful that you, you think I'm good enough. Um, that it, there's definitely a barrier uh, to overcome in that. Uh, I did think that it was interesting that after she lawyered up and got her lawyer to check into, you know, how she compared with her predecessor in terms of pay, that things got pretty ugly pretty fast. So I don't think it's a coincidence, and, but I think it's a very good question. So I don't know how, how we want to address it here, but... Um, I think it's a very hard thing to prove, and I've had these discussions uh, with people. It's almost impossible to prove that you're making less than someone unless you're at the top and you see there's complete transparency. So I always say it's up to women when they get into positions at the top to make sure that isn't the case. I'm sure it exists, but I think there are places where it doesn't exist. But that's something that you would never be privy to that information uh, very hard to find out unless a colleague has told you and you can prove it, which even if someone has told you, it's a very hard thing to prove, um, that 
you know, it's it's hard to draw battle lines until you know and you have that that information. So to me, I think the most important thing is that when men or women uh, become, take on roles at the top as chief editors or even CEOs for that matter, they take the responsibility being male or female to make sure that there is not that discrepancy. I think what's important is to know your worth. And that was a lesson that um, I came to only now and only recently. Uh, before in my career, I let somebody else do that for me. I deferred that job of defining my worth to an agent. I work in the broadcast industry, so in television, uh, you hire agents who brand you, promote you, and rustle up interest, try to leverage your brand wherever it is in your newsroom to the next market. And that's how you grow your broadcast career. I always deferred that to somebody else because I wanted to focus on just doing a great job and letting people see how great I am without taking any responsibility myself of standing up, saying in a clear voice, this is the job that I did, this is the impact, and wasn't that great, wasn't that effective. I didn't get to that place until I saw everybody else who was doing that step in front of me and move forward. Even though I felt that perhaps my stories that was winning awards should have the same recognition, if not more. What was the difference? I was the difference. I held myself back by not speaking up. When I learned to make a very clear statement of fact, I'm not saying anything that is not untrue. This is what happened. It's my work. And it did have a positive impact. I was clearly stating my case as my own best advocate, because nobody else is going to do that for you. So to the point of money, be clear on what you're worth. Be clear on your status in the industry and in the community. So how do you do that? You're all good journalists, right? What do you do? You knock on doors and you ask questions. What do you do? You advocate for the underdog in your story. Why don't you do that for yourself? The moment that you turn those skill sets and advocate for yourself, you knock on doors, you ask around, you do research, you figure out in your industry, in this top job, who's getting what, whom, where, why, what are the benefits, what are the things, what are the strategies that you can employ? And then when you go and have a conversation with your boss, with a person who has that decision-making power, Remember, you have a lot of leverage. They want you to do the job you're doing and or more. Your leverage is, I'm worth that and can do more, but let's talk turkey. And I think that's the most effective way to do it. I just have, I just have a quick question. Was your agent male or female? Just add to that. I, I think what you're saying is absolutely true, but I think you can only do that at a certain point of your career. Because I think when there's a lot of people who are just starting out, they are hungry for jobs. I mean, I, I get a lot of job applications on my desk, right? And um, it, in some ways, there's a lot of qualified people out there. In some ways, it comes down to luck when you're just starting out. And, and I think when as you grow and as you you know go up the ranks that becomes a lot and i had the same epiphany as you as well and but it wasn't until a certain point in my career where i was actually willing to say i don't need this job i can walk away that i was able to do that before i don't think i could do that um from a money perspective as a manager i, I was able to see the salaries of some people that I worked with. Um, and I would say actually my perception is that salaries have undergone like a major dislocation in the last five years. You sort of have um, people who I would call like legacy journalists who might have been working for 20, 25 years. And they were promoted into a certain salary 
stratosphere, you know, back, you know, they got on this track before the internet, before lots of things, especially really affected print media. And so their salaries are at a, at a level that are, are, are quite high, and I would say, you know, for the kind of work they do, quite reasonable. But as those people age out or leave the organizations, they're being replaced by a new um, cohort of people who are being paid fractions of what uh, the people who left are. And um, I don't think have any reasonable expectation of getting to that level. So there's a very strange mix of salaries going on at, at organizations that I'm aware of. And um, you know, this is a very difficult problem to deal with because most organizations aren't in the habit of cutting people's salaries who have been on the job for like 20 years. Um, but at the same time, you have a new group of people coming in who have a completely new set of skills, you know, multimedia or whatever. They're, they're just, you know, they know more about tech. They're quicker, they're savvier, whatever, on certain things. So, um, you know, I think sal salary parity is a very difficult issue right now, and it really does behoove you to do as much research as you're saying uh, in terms of what people are getting. But um, the discrepancies are very, very wide, and I, I think are undergoing a period of slow, <laughs> slow adjustment. But um, there, there is a lot of inequality. But, can I just make one quick, quick comment. Yes. But then your point is that it's not so much gender difference no. in salary. No, it's not. But rather between legacy media and uh, digital media, the new generation, right? But. Um, I can see that that's true, but that's going to change pretty quickly too. Is that right? Uh, and then also you have new uh, uh, or digital media, right? Like Busby, like Vox, right? And so some things that a lot is going on, uh, and the industry is being disrupted. So and that takes us beyond the gender issue. Hi, good morning. Um, I want to ask a question that's based on culture. So a lot of things that we talked about in AAJ in particular is how your culture influences you to whether you could succeed or not succeed within the corporate environment. And, you know, m you know Ying, you lived in the States for a very long time. I assume that, you know, Angie and, and Deborah and, you know, you guys are Americans. And how does that play out in the context of Asian for the Asian women here? where they haven't lived in the States, you know, they might view, you know, the American women as say, hey, they're aggressive, they're assertive. Sometimes they can be bossy ladies. And so for the Asian women here who want to ascend, what are your advice for them? To, because I don't think, you know, if you are facing challenges right now here, imagine their challenges could be much, much greater. So what are some of your practical advice for them I, I don't know if that actually is true. I mean, if that were the case that the pushy American women uh, who have grown up in that sort of culture of, of, of being comfortable at promoting themselves uh, were more successful, then we would see very different stats globally. But actually, the stats are still quite modest in terms of females who have ascended to the top ranks of the media industry wherever it is in the world. I mean, that said, I think that's a very good point. Um, as a manager at Reuters, one of the things that uh, managers did was to try to give more coaching and assist Asia candidates to present themselves more confidently. Because I can tell you that is an absolute true truth that, that many people in this part of the world are, are, less, will, are, are less comfortable in, in that setting of having to push themselves because of many cultural considerations. Like all the messages you heard growing up, or at least I heard growing up, you know, don't be too boastful. You know, let, let your work speak for yourself. You don't have to like promote. It's just too, too arrogant if you, you say so many great things about yourself. And I think it crosses male and female as well. It's just a cultural kind of way of thinking. But I'd love to hear your tips as to, you know, how people I think who, it's absolutely yeah. true what Paul addressed. It's exactly what holds us all back, whether we're here in Asia or in North America. I think that one of the things that culturally that we've all grown up with from an Asian household are those Confucius elements, those 
respect your elders, don't show off, be humble, be modest, don't embarrass our family or your entire race. These are, these are things that are ingrained in us. And while I did see role models in people seeing characteristics of people that I admired, I didn't see myself because it, there wasn't necessarily somebody who looked like me. And that's when I learned early on that mentors can be from any gender, any race, any culture. If they have traits that I admire, that's somebody who I should be talking with, following, and admiring. You don't have to look like me to, for me to see myself in them. I think it held me back, certainly, early on in my career. Just like I said, I'll just let my work speak for itself. I won't show off because that's a bad Asian culture. Uh, but in fact, learning to speak up and being fact-based and being confident, you are representing the best of Asia. You are representing the best of your culture. These are things that we need to aspire to. Be the nail that stands up because while somebody might want to hammer you down, if all the nails stand up, it's going to be an incredible show of force. I think that that is an evolution, and I hope that for those of you who have not yet found your voice, to really think clearly and be reflective of what's stopping you. Because you know what? Is it, it isn't anybody else. It's the person who's staring you in the mirror. That's the only person who's stopping you from speaking up. Well, I, it's so funny. When you asked that question, I was thinking, I'm one of the rare people I grew up with both cultures because my father's um, Hong Kong Chinese and my mother's like a fiery Italian American. And so my um, father's favorite expression when we were growing up was turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek. And my mother was like, fight, fight, fight. So I was hugely conflicted in, in that sense. But, uh, but I also think, I mean, I agree with what Angie's saying. It's just, you know, you, you allow yourself the time to get confident within your abilities. And once you're confident I within your abilities, you're going to meet people all the time who are just schmoozers. And they're really good at schmoozing, but there's actually not a lot of substance there, right? So you let those people continue schmoozing, and then you eventually see their demise. If you can rely on your own capabilities and you can find a voice within yourself to speak up, um, no matter how you were, I mean, you know, I, a, a lot of people think, oh, it's the education system, you know, it's more rote in Asia, people don't, um, can't be wrong, but I, I only think that's, that, that excuse goes just until the day of graduation, because I have seen really fiery women now who are kick-ass in private equity who grew up in mainland China, never had a day's education in the U.S., and they are just kick-ass women, period, in the boardroom or, you know, anywhere. So I don't think it's, I, I think it's your individual experience, and if you can rely on yourself, and you, but you also have to allow yourself the time to build credibility, and I think once you build credibility, then you can start to stand up and say, yes, I've proven myself. But I don't think it comes right away. I think, you know, maybe for some people it's easier than others, but you do have to put in the blood, sweat, and tears uh, before you can get to a certain point. <laughs> no, they teach me. <laughs> uh, but I think there's a little, ch there's changing going on with the new generation of women or Asian women, the social media, right? Uh, and we, we're different, live in different worlds, sort of. Um, so in terms of my advice is that, um, yes, you know, n know your worth, build your worth, well, uh, build your worth, okay? Don't give yourself any excuses, whether it be race, ethnicity, uh, uh, gender, all right? Uh, we're all in this together. Do the best journalism you can, you know, still back to the old basics. Um, that's number one. Number two is uh, you build allies. And what if you're in the newsroom, or even I'm working at the university, 
a, a diversion, right? You, you think the new, newsrooms or news managers are, 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 are a tough job? I mean, university presidents or mani man upper management, they're not professional managers. Who said that star researchers or professors can be good managers? Right? The same thing, right? So, but then uh, you build your allies in, within your own organization. I have wonderful mentors. When I started at the Daily News in 1990, uh, I was freaking scared because I, it's the, my first job in an English daily newspaper, right? Or any English paper. But I have good friends, I have mentors, you know. And when I did my article, I would, you know, when I wrote my lead, I would send it to the guy across from, uh, uh, from me and said, does this work, right? And then he, he would shoot back uh, to me, right? So you need friends. And number three is you pick your battles. So um, I agree with Deborah, is that you, you can't fight all the time. You know, especially when you're starting out, you need to really use your common sense, right? Um, so, like, again, at the daily news, I mean, daily news is very toxic. I mean, it's equal opportunity misery. Uh, or, <laughs> um, uh, and actually, three months after I started, the, we all went out on a five-month strike. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so it's toxic. So I would have, uh, because I, I, I'm the first hire who can speak Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and, Ch uh, and Cantonese, and to speak the Chinatown, and, and there are more stories now happen in Chinatown, right? So something breaks, you know? I, I would go to do the story, so I do. Um, then, like one time, there was a star columnist, and, and then want me to go out with him to cover a breaking story in Chinatown. So I'm, I was very polite. I said, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, because I have my own story. I'm going there myself. So, you know, very politely, basically I said, I'm not going to be your interpreter. You need to help yourself, right? And did the story myself, right? So, but then you, these are little things, you know, you can handle it, you don't have to scream, you know, you don't have to go to the boss to complain, right? Uh, but these things happen. So use your common sense and know your worth, but build your worth. I think that's an excellent point. You do have to identify what you're really good at. And I can promise you, every single one of you is great at something, but you have to discover what that is. Male or female, that's what's gonna stand you through. And hopefully what you're great at is also what you're really excited and passionate about. And if you do what you love, that's gonna push you further than anything else. It's not, it is about the money, you do have to care about the money, but first take that self inventory and ask yourself, what is my uniqueness? What is my special strength? I mean, everyone on this panel has discovered it. And that's what's pushed you through even the more difficult times. Questions, more questions out there. Uh, thanks. There are more female journalists than male, but there are more male leaders in journalism. So uh, I want to uh, know that um, how difficult or, or how hard it is for a female journalist if you want to become a leader or stand as high as the male. Thanks. I'm sure everyone has an individual story who wants to. Julie, would you like to share how you ascended? Um, I, I think it is hard. I mean, I've. I've often been in meetings where we're deciding what story is going on the front page, or even I'm leading a meeting, deciding what's going on the front page, and I look around the room and realize I'm the only woman. <laughs> um, and I was talking last night with a good friend of mine who's 66 years old. He's been in journalism for 40-something years, and I told him I was going to be on this panel today, and he said, is that still an issue? Ooh. And um, and I, you know, he's a very good-hearted person. I find him very sensitive. And he said, you know, when I was hired in journalism 40 years ago, you know, a woman hired me and I was surrounded by women and, you know, I kind of thought this was over. He said, but, and Maury talks, said, but I sort of feel like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe it started to reverse or some, we hit, there was a wall that was hit. So, um, I went back and looked, and I'll add to your statistics, but um, there was a study of American newsrooms in 2013. Um, that study showed that the women, uh, 
women were 38% of newsroom staff, and it was stagnant for 14 years, and up only four percentage points from um, 1983. So it, it seems like things have stagnated. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what the reasons are, but I, I do perceive in my own experience that um, there is definitely a, a strong kind of boys network that still exists. And it's hard to find women um, role models to help you move up. And so I do think it, I think it is wise to find role models, even if they're not women, and try to emulate people and actively seek them out and actually say, like, I w I'm looking for a mentor. I'm, I need some advice on my personal style. Or what would you suggest I do next? What risk do you think I should take? For myself, some of the ways I got ahead were by taking the least attractive jobs. Um, when I started out at the Washington Post, I was a copy editor, and um, then I, I moved into uh, then I moved into reporting for a year, and then there was a job opening for the night cops editor, which I believe the shift was Wednesday through Sunday. You started at seven. 6 p.m. and you got off at 2 a.m. So that meant like no weekends, really, no social life on weekends, no social life really at all, um, and uh, you know odd sleep patterns and stuff. But I did that job for two or three years, and it was fantastic experience. And because then I took a job that was even later. <laughs> I came in at 7 p.m. to be the night foreign editor, and I stayed till 3 a.m. And again, I had no social life. Um, so I did give up some things and uh, to get ahead. But sometimes you have to, I don't regret those decisions because I was, I was doing a job when I was in my early 20s that you know I would not have otherwise been able to do. And sometimes you have to put yourself in those positions to demonstrate what you can do. Take something that seems unattractive at first, but actually gives you a chance to show off your skills, and, and that worked for me. I think for global media organizations, you do have to show a willingness to be posted to different places, and they won't always be the places you want to be posted to. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate because uh, I've been married for a long time, for 27 years, but I have no kids, and I think that that helped with our mobility, moving from New York to Dallas to Kuala Lumpur to Singapore to Hanoi to Bangalore to Singapore, to Bangalore, eventually to Hong Kong. But I think that, and it's tough for women. It's tough for women who have families, who have kids to raise and kids to think about. Uh, but for those who can make those decisions on mobility, I think the, the increased globalization of many organizations means that they want to be able to see that you come, come to them with that kind of portfolio, that kind of understanding of different markets, because people now operate across many markets. So it's increasing your market value as well. Um, to follow on this great point, especially for the young women there, get out. Get out. Uh, when you don't have a family yet, when you don't have kids, right, don't worry buying in your own flat or apartment, right, especially to those who are from the mainland, China, mainland, right, get out, right. So you build your portfolio, you learn, right, do whatever you can, and the industry is changing, right? You know, you, you can start a blog, you can start your reporting, you can uh, gang up with some friends, right? Uh, develop your own uh, journalism project, right? The technology is available, it's much cheaper. Take risk, and, and that's my advice to, 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 to my students all the time, right? And uh, so just get out. There's so many stories that are waiting to be told, untold, Right? Go to Myanmar, go to Africa, you know, strike up some uh, uh, partnerships with young people like you. Do the story. So um, I have three children, and um, I took four and five years off from my career to raise um, my first two who were born in London. And um, I am very much of the view that the conversation around equality um, can be diminished significantly if companies allow their room for women to come back into the workforce and have more flexi time. And you might ask, well, how do you do that? And I 
I think what's wonderful about the newsroom is there are a lot of jobs within the newsroom to be a journalist. And there should be more part-time jobs. Um, every time I've asked an employer if I could work full-time uh, in my career, they've said no. Um, not the journal, I went back full-time, but uh, my previous experiences, I, when I was trying to get back into the workforce, I went to a number of organizations and I proposed a job share. I proposed a part-time. I proposed uh, all different types of formulas and every single time I was rejected and they said no. And when I asked what the reasons were, I was given, um, we can't deal with the head count that way. We can't deal with the insurance. And I even offered with one organization, I said, I don't want insurance, my husband has insurance. And they said, sorry, we can't get around it. So every time I'm on one of these panels, and you know, there's mostly students here, but I always call on corporations to think about that. Because in order to have that flexible time, unless you're married to a husband who, and unfortunately I'm not, I'm married to a, a man who travels a lot and has a lot of demands as well on his job. So I need to be able to have flexibility uh, to a certain extent. And so I learned quickly, um, but it took a while actually, but in my, as a mother, I learned quickly that to put down those terms to, in the beginning. So when I started work at the Wall Street Journal, I wanted to go back full time and I wanted to work full time, but I knew one thing that was really important to me were my summers and having a month off with my kids. So I sat down and I met this wholeheartedly and I said, there's a lot of things I'll negotiate with you, but the one thing I will not negotiate on is I want a month of time off with my kids. I said, that's not too much to ask for a full-time working mom of three. And it was pretty easy and I was surprised, but bef previous to this job, I was, I was scared to say that because I, was, I thought after being rejected over and over again to job shares part-time, um, I was afraid to say that until this past job, and they said, sure, no problem. So it was a lot easier. You're absolutely right. It, it's an economic issue. It's a corporate business issue. It's not a woman's issue. I mean, until men start having, being able to have babies, I don't think that's time coming anytime soon, women will have to repopulate the planet. It's just a fact of life. Companies need to wake up and realize this. And therefore, if you don't want to lose 50% of some of the best, ta most talented people in your workforce, you do have to make those HR policies and other corporate policies align to what is a reality. And it, it is a shame that women have to sometimes be apologetic about it or be afraid to ask for something that is so natural and so commonsensical. Um, but it, it, speak, it does speak to a broader point. So I'm, I'm glad that you found a solution here and that you were very open about it with your, with your new boss. So that's terrific. Can I just follow up on something Ying said? I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that I, when I was investigating this topic statistically is um, there was this study done um, by the Global Media Monitoring Project in 2005, which said that 20, only 21% of um, subjects of news are women. Um, and I just want to point out for women out there that, as Ying said, there are so many untold stories. And so many of those stories are women's stories. And I don't mean to pigeonhole women journalist is only being able to report on women's issues and women's news. I find that very tedious. But <laughs> the but is there are so many fantastic stories that are centered on women that are of interest to everybody. I was just trying to think about in the past year the stories we've had, um, the Malala Yousafzai story in Pakistan, the, um, the Hong Kong, um, the Irwana, is that her name? Yeah. The Indonesian woman in Hong Kong who was abused, um, the Boko Haram story in Africa, the rapes in India. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of stories that we've reported in China um, forced abortions, leftover women, um, the first woman who sued for employment discrimination in China. Um, even I did a story on Xi Jinping's wife. Um, these are all fascinating stories that we as women might be more attuned to, we might have better access, we might have a more interesting perspective, sources might be more open to speaking with us than they would be to men. And I think it's important to look for those stories, take advantage of them, and 
um, you know, use them to build your career. You know, you don't have to be this woman who writes the employment discrimination story every time it's, you know, every time the study comes out. But, you know, think about w the advantage you do have as a woman. When I was, I was mentoring some female journalists in Afghanistan, and it was a very interesting experience. I had a male Afghan journalist told me that he thought of me as a foreign woman as a third sex, not male, <laughs> not female, um, but someone who could kind of move in between. And um, I found that a very interesting perspective, and it made me realize there were a lot of stories that I could do that my male colleagues couldn't. Of course, there are stories as a woman that, I, that my male colleagues can do that I can't do either, but um, look for those, um, those niches or those cracks, get yourself in there. And I think you'll find some really interesting stories. We have time for a question. Yes, another question, one more question. Um, you talk about a lot of difficulties for women to be um, a leader. What about the advantages that that can help women to get to the top? Thank you. Mm, who wants to take this one? You're you're an amalgam of so many incredible gifts that is not gender specific. Um, what we place out to the broader world is your responsibility. Unfortunately, when people look back at you, there are a lot of perceptions that they've placed, whether they are real or false, but they are perceptions nonetheless. I think that you are blessed with a gift, whether you're male or female, of just being who you are, so own it. Um, I think that your style, your confidence, your charm is natural to yourself, whether you are a man or a woman. But understand as well that people are relating to you based on your appearance or how you look or how you present yourself. So be malleable, be conscious of that. There are a lot of benefits to being who you are, whether you are a man or a woman. Um, but in this world, I think we are very lucky to live in an age where we are very conscious of all of these things because we've talked about it. We're on a panel today, but this is not unique. This is a continuum of a conversation that started when women started ne being needed in the workforce because of world war. And the men went off to war and the women needed to work and proved themselves. That is a continuum, and we continue to drive that forward. Japan, Shinzo Abe recognizing that you can't grow an economy when people are getting old, but you can if you tap into women who are traditionally seen as the person who stays at home and not a breadwinner. It's changing the perceptions based on need. So we are an incredible moment in our mutual history. There are a lot of benefits, and it's just recognizing how somebody perceives you, but being malleable to communicating to them in their language sometimes. And that's your flexibility. I have a story to share that I still don't know how I feel about, but it kind of uh, speaks to one of the questions you're asking. Um, when I was at Star TV, uh, we would go into our morning meeting and at that time we had a show where we'd cover the region. So we would fly everywhere and you know, interview leaders or whoever. And it, the Philippines was up and we were talking about you know, interviewing, what interviews we would get. And uh, one of them was, um, Joseph Estrada was the president at the time. And I remember, um, someone saying, oh yeah, we have to interview Joseph Estrada. We haven't heard from him yet. You know, he's this colorful movie star who became the president of the Philippines. And then a male colleague of mine stood up and he's like, yeah, he's supposed to be a total pervert. We should send Deborah." And I didn't know how to react to that. So at first I was like, <gasps> but then I said, don't speak. My father and always taught me don't say anything when you don't really know how you're feeling. And at that point, I was a little bit shocked and angry at the same time. So I was like, just don't say anything. Anyway, it did turn out that 
I went to the Philippines to interview the president after getting an interview with him. And I flew to Manila and it turned out there really wasn't, although the press secretary had told me that I had a scheduled time, there really was not an interview scheduled. So I ended up getting the president's schedule for the next few days and I learned that he was gonna be in the countryside um, having lunch with poor people, which farming, you know, um, people, poor people in the community, which he always made a point to do. And we got there and we left at like three o'clock in the morning and drove to like four hours outside Manila. And I saw them setting up the tables and they put a big uh, gold bow around his chair. So I just sat there thinking, I can't go back until I have an interview with Estrada because I came down here thinking I have one. And I sat down and the crowd started to fill. Then he walks over eventually, he sits down and I raised my hand and I was like, Mr. President, you know, I'd really like to come to Malacanan and hear how, what the, the, the people outside the Philippines want to hear about you as a president and da 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 da. And he's like, okay, 10 o'clock, be there Wednesday morning, you know. And then I walked away and I felt really, yes, I got the interview, finally. But then I thought to myself, wait, did I just get that? Because I was a woman, like I was kind of dressed up and did I get that? Was was this, this uh, colleague of mine right? Was it because I was a woman? So it was a very kind of introspective time for me and I thought, I don't know that it was, but I mean, I was kind of dressed up and I was with farmers in the Philippines and I definitely did stand out. So, you know, had my male colleague gone, would he have gotten that interview? I don't know the answer to that, but the fact that that happened, it got me thinking about it. And then I thought, well, is that, was that a good thing or not? And I was like, if you're, if, when I was sitting inside that morning meeting, no, it wasn't a good thing. I was like, I can get an interview because I'm a good journalist, period, whether I'm man or male or female. But then, unfortunately, once I went on the story, I thought, oh, well, maybe I did get it. I have no idea. But it got me thinking, and I don't really know the answer to what, you know, how, I'm not comfortable saying, oh, I'm not the type of person who feels comfortable enough to say, oh, you need to give me this interview or do this because I'm a woman, which some people are more comfortable. And it, at times, maybe it does get them farther, you know, but I've never been one of those people. And when I finished the interview with Estrada, I, I was so glad that I got it, but I did walk away and something just wasn't sitting right. So that's my answer. We'll let Julian Ying round us off here. I don't I don't think you should feel bad about that at all because I don't think there's a man or male reporter who's like been in like a you know gym locker room or some other male on male setting and like got some tip from another guy and then the male reporter walks away and thinks awesome I just got that because I'm a dude you know what I mean <laughs> like it, I don't think of, I don't know maybe if there's a male reporter here in the room who wants to counter me but um, you know I don't I don't think men ever reflect on oh I got that story because I'm a man. And so I don't think as women we should feel bad about that at all. The, the world is the way it is. Men and women are different. Men respond differently to women sometimes than they do men. And women respond differently to women sometimes than they do men. And let's just do it in the service of journalism and, and, and move on. I, I don't think you should feel bad I, about it. I think that's a great story. And I agree. You, know, you, you did a great job because you have good instincts as a reporter. Um, and I, I think, no, 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 I think the reason why I felt bad about it is because I felt like, wow, that was so amazing that I was able to get a schedule and be there, and wow, I deserve this because I'm a good reporter, right? Absolutely. So maybe the gender help a bit, we don't know, but then it's really for management to appreciate that is to the media, to the organization advantage to hire women because we have a lot to bring to the table. So not because, uh, oh, you're women, you know, yeah, and, and, but really because they can bring a lot to the women, uh, uh, to the table. And it's not just for women, but it's also for immigrants, for ethnic minorities in, in Hong Kong, right? We would like to see more diversity um, and that would make the story so much better. 10 seconds. Um, this went through my mind. When we started at the journal, I had an all women's team. There is about four of us on for my team. And it's and I thought to myself, oh, well, maybe I have to diversify and hire more males. 
I happened to end up hiring more males, but not because they were males. And then I thought, no, I should just look for the best candidate, right? And, but if it were reversed, would I be thinking I need to add more women to my team? You know, and for, for, we're very comfortable today saying you need to hire more women for the sake of balancing things out, but I don't necessarily think it's always the other way around. I just want to share final. an anecdote uh, just because that was a great story. I love it. Um, and to your question, because I was speaking very 10,000 feet, but in real life, um, they never saw me coming because what did they see? Oh, they saw a nice little Asian uh, reporter, very oh, soft-spoken. And uh, I was a special investigative consumer reporter uh, at the ABC station, Cleveland. And they never saw me coming. Oh, who is this? Oh, she's, oh, she looks good oh, in a dress and so nice. And whoa, where, where, where did this come from? And, you know, advocating for the story, advocating for the audience. And it was a very effective tool. So you kind of do a little jujitsu sometimes, and it works in your favor. Thank you. Uh, I, it's, it's hot, I can tell, and we have a break, so I think we can yeah, continue this discussion during the break. I want to thank all my panelists. You were wonderful, fantastic, fabulous. Thank you, audience, Ying, Deborah, Angie, Julie. And a quick plug, Women Media Networks. I'm the president of the Hong Kong chapter. Look us up uh, on the internet, womenmedianetworks.com. Uh, and we have events every month, so look us up if you're in Hong Kong and would like to attend. Thank you very much, Remy. All right, thank you. you very much. A uh, round of applause for Christina as well as a moderator for this. Thank you so much. Again, check out her uh, website, Women Media Network. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We're running a little bit late, but it's okay. This is a terrific conversation. Please be back here at 10.30. Our next session uh, will be 2014 Press Freedoms in Asia, and we're going to debut uh, a short video from Kevin Lau, Ming Pao reporter who was stabbed a few months ago, uh, right here at N3Con. Thank you. <laughs>